great to have you back here. You were last on the stage last year at <laughs> yeah. this time. Uh, Island is a $10 billion revenues company. You've been CEO since 2012, and you are still, you were the first female to run a pharmaceutical company, and you are still the only female to run a pharmaceutical yeah, company. Sad. sad. <laughs> What's up For all that? those in science out there. You know, I'm not sure. I, uh, you know, I think like many of us scratch our heads about what, what are, what, what happens that there seems to be such a block in some industries more than others. I, you know, I think that um, obviously the, the pharmaceutical industry has stemmed a lot from science, and I, you know, I know there's been a lot of great discussion about how I think there can be very <clears throat> unconscious filters for women, and I think more so perhaps in the pharmaceutical industry because, you know, typically to be a CEO where you coming from the CEO is running the businesses, and you know, I think we have brilliant women out there that are innovative and in an R and D. And, but that doesn't necessarily give you the path to, to, to run the company. And I, so, you know, I, I have, uh, like I said, scratched my head just about our numbers overall as CEOs uh, in the Fortune 500 companies. But it is perplexing. And I, I, hope that, I hope that it is one of those things that girls see it and realize that they can strive to, you know, push, those, push the comfort zone and push those boundaries, that it's not all about you have to start in one department and I've said you know the greatest gift I had was being able to work in 15 different departments and you started you know, by typing up stickers I on did products I started in the, in the bot literally in the double the basement. wide right yeah the basement and uh, almost 24 years ago yeah. so you know I hope that the more of us that are out there setting examples that girls can realize that they can go outside of their comfort zone and really I think understand the path that that leads you to where you want to go yep so the company, um, there's been a lot going on, frankly, since, <laughs> since the last time we all spoke. Um, mm -hmm. Dramatic couple of years, you moved the company to Amsterdam, you briefly, or perhaps still became the political poster child for inversion. Mm -hmm. um, then you survived a hostile bid by Teva for your company, um, and in part because of some laws that were specific to the Netherlands that allowed you to, to uh, named board members that then voted mm -hmm. against the deal. Um, why did you do that? <laughs> I, I'm tired listening to everything that you just said. We I'm just did getting started here. <laughs> um, you know what's interesting? I'll go back a couple, several years ago, and had a lot of conversations up on Capitol Hill saying there's an unlevel playing field in our country, the tax code the way that we really penalize uh, U.S.-based companies, and, and at least our sector, the healthcare sector, which has had hyper-competitiveness and activity in the M&A space, we were the last kind of standing U.S.-based company. And so I'm competing against companies that so have 5% So just to be clear, you're talking about in the generic space? Yeah, specialty pharmaceutical. We literally were the last one still in the United States. And so I'm competing against companies that have 5% tax rates that can have a much you know, larger balance sheet to be able to compete for assets. It, it huge disadvantage. And, you know, unfortunately, Congress, there was no signs of Congress doing anything soon. So we had continued to say we weren't going to do just a deal to do an inversion. However, if the opportunity presented itself, we would. And so when we acquired Abbott's generics business, their established products throughout Europe, it gave us the opportunity to uh, invert. And we did. And, you know, yes, it became part of the perfect storm. Um, but, and, your, and your dad, who is a senator uh, from West Virginia, did in fact oppose this before he didn't. He didn't see the light in the beginning. Unfortunately, <laughs> I think like many, you know, it's a, it, you can have a sound bite. I always say don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. Um, but the reality is, the reality is, is that we need to remain competitive. And when I said, you know, dad, we have 5,000 employees in Morgantown, West Virginia. We're one of the largest employers in West Virginia. I said, I can guarantee you, if we don't protect ourselves, no one's going to protect those jobs and the other jobs that we want to grow here in the United States. So perversely, it seems counterintuitive that we needed to invert to grow here in the United States, which is exactly what we're continuing to try to do, is, it, it, even with our most recent uh, acquisition target of Perigo. OK, so let's, in one second, move on to that. But <laughs> But beforehand, one of the byproducts of this inversion was that you, there was a little-known law in the Netherlands called Stichting, I think I got that right, 
which uh, helped. became the favorite word on CNBC in the last yeah, yes. three months. Um, this concept or this rule basically allowed you to oppose the takeover, even though a lot of Wall Street really wanted you to go forward with the deal. Mm -hmm. And now there are a couple of shareholder lawsuits around that. Um, it, did they just not do their homework and not understand that this was part of the situation? I will say this, for all of my years in, in corporate America, I continued to be shocked at, I think, how unprepared many that stay very superficial and I don't think really understand um, until, until there's a fire, until there's a crisis that people then have to dig deep. What I would say and what you know, got a lot of airtime is we were, we were a Pennsylvania corporation since the, the early 70s. And Pennsylvania, as some may know in here, is a stakeholder state versus a shareholder state. And all that means is that shareholders are an extremely important stakeholder, but we can take other things into consideration, what's in the best of the company, the employees, the, but so it's one of many. And unlike Delaware, that's where many companies have ended up domiciling, is very shareholder driven. Um, which means price kind of trumps everything else. When we, were, when we were inverting, you know, we did a lot of homework and looked at a lot of different countries because we had the opportunity to really domicile where we wanted to. And the Netherlands was a very natural because it had, a, it had the same exact feel and laws and philosophical as Pennsylvania did. So from our perspective, we said we had always been a stakeholder company. With that being said, over the last eight years, we returned 30% KGAR to our shareholders, total shareholder return. I've said a well-run company is, does great by its shareholders, and we've continued to do that. I think there is a lot of noise and a lot of the rhetoric was, well, if, you don't, if shareholders don't come first and the dollar amount doesn't come first, then you know Wall Street has frowned upon that. Right. And right. that short-term driving for the quarter is, you know, I think, is going to continue to be unhealthy for our country. I hope that people continue to step back and say, you know, you can't build a great company quarter by quarter. And, you know, I was looking at some interesting statistics that in the 70s, the average people held stock for an average of eight years. Today, it's six months. And That's an average number. And, you know, I think that speaks volumes to what's incentivizing corporate behavior. They feed off each other. And, and you've said, we don't cater, you said this in the fortune story, we don't cater to Wall Street and they don't like that. That's a little bit like waving a red flag in the face of, of your shareholders, isn't it? Well, and sometimes you guys like to write stories and pick those exact It's a pretty good quote, I, I mean, let's face it. <laughs> that I strung it together exactly like that. You know, look, I think what we've tried to bring attention to and we've not shied away from is that we have been building a great company and returning great returns for shareholders. We, have, we went from uh, the, being founded in 1961, literally in the trunk of a car in rural West Virginia, to employing 35,000 people all over the world. We're one of the largest generic specialty companies in the world. Perigo will be... So let me just give you a little intro yes. on Perigo, uh, and then I will let you go. But, but Following the end of the Teva deal, uh, you launched your own hostile bid for the, an Irish company, Perigo. Um, if you win, I believe this is going to be the largest hostile takeover in history, and this, uh, this will be determined in the next month. So why do you want Perigo, and, and what's likely to happen here, and why, why doesn't Wall Street, or much of Wall Street, support the deal? Um, so the only first thing I'll correct real, real quickly is we actually put lobbed our tender, our approach to Perigo prior to Teva, That's and right. then okay. Teva kind of jumped in the fray. Um, so when we step back, the transactions we've done over the last eight years that first took us global because we questions were, ready by the way. We were a U.S.-based company, pharmaceutical company. Um, a leader in the U.S. space. About eight years ago, we bought the Merck's generics business and went global, put us in 100 countries overnight, and truly have had just an amazing growth trajectory since. As we've done transactions, building up our injectables business and looking at different dosage form, therapeutic areas, geographies, it's always been about what we can create when we combine with a company. It's not so much the company on a standalone basis. It's what will continue to be complementary. We've not just done 
financial transactions for the sake of a transaction, for the sake of a synergy, for the sake of inverting. It's been about what is that best business combination. We have, we have critical mass around the retail pharmacy where one out of uh, 14 scripts in the United States is filled with a Mylan product. And while we're not a household name yet, I think we will be someday. Um, when you look at the physician channel, the Abbott business, we've, we, EpiPen is our flagship uh, You brand brought that product. to gave that a billion dollar product. Right? Yes. So it's, you know, again, building awareness. We continue to do things, I would say, perhaps maybe not as conventional or taken the traditional path, but we have grown and built a great company that now is looking about how do we continue to add that financial uh, stability, but also give us that leverage across all distribution channels. So Perigo is one of the largest OTC companies, really um, is a great complementary business to Mylan in the sense that from the United States through Europe, it really increases our distribution channels. It will, it will definitely give us the size and scale to continue to compete in you know, what is a very, very globally competitive So, So it's industry. really a sort of a diversification play, but at the same time, it's not an obvious earnings slash Right, I it's just, dilutive I to our shareholders, which is why One opportunity for questions if, if there are any in the room, and please raise your hand high. If so, I'm sorry to cut you off, Heather. We're just so short on time. Uh, yes. Okay, my name's Eileen Gordon. I'm chairman and CEO of Ingredion. We're in 40 countries, but based in the US. My question is this, did the inversion change your culture? Did you have to change how you did business or was it just on a paper transaction where you had to move a bunch of people to the Netherlands and did you want it to change your culture? So it has not changed our culture. It absolutely changed how our board operates and where major decisions need to be made. So our Board meetings, um, while we're governed out of the Netherlands, uh, our tax base is out of the UK. So we have board meetings in London, major decisions need to take place in London, and our annual meetings are in, are in the Netherlands. So, you know, I would say operationally, it absolutely did not. We still run the company out of the United States, live in the United States, and I think there's a lot of misnomer out there from inversions. You know, I continue to get hit with, well, you don't want to pay taxes in the U.S. I said, we still pay every tax we ever paid in the United States and any tax that we paid prior to inverting. It's just once you invert, then you don't pay the United States taxes for everything you make in the rest of the world. And I think, again, a lot of misnomer out there about the realities of inverting. And. And uh, I just wanted to end with, with one comment that you had once said that Mylan was like the girl in a large Italian family. <laughs> it was a David, David and Goliath story. And I just thought, you know, you are the girl from the large Italian family. Yeah. Do you see this in some ways as a, as a personal you know, crusade, I, the way that you think about the company? You know, I, look, I, I think at the end of the day, um, what, what we pride ourselves, and I'm humbled to be able to represent this platform, is, is it's really about being authentic and caring. And for any of those from big ethnic family knows there's a lot of caring and a lot of tough ways. Um, but that it is about kind of being the underdog. And I absolutely grew up feeling a bit like I had to prove myself. You know, I had a lot of big personalities, a lot of men, a lot of feelings about what was girl work, what was boy work, and I never quite understood that. And so I was fortunate that you know, I continue to be very curious and want to know, you know why I couldn't do men's work. Um, and I think Mylan as a company kind of grew up that great American success story and has grown into really you know, fighting the fight, taking on, yes, a David and Goliath, the big pharma versus the generics, bringing affordable medicine. We want to bring access to affordable medicine to seven billion people. And those are audacious goals and I would say growing up and rural West Virginia and Italian family, you know, you have to dream big. And I think Mylan is dreaming big. Mylan is definitely dreaming big. Thank you so much, Heather. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.